people of Monaghan have many of the same, indeed almost identical concerns to the people of Sligo and the people of Castle Bar and cancer patients in Castle Bar have the same concerns as the people of Sligo. And then you travel elsewhere across Ireland and then you go across to the UK and to France and to Germany and all the way over to Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, down to Bulgaria, Italy and you find out that all over Europe there's almost half a billion people who have many of the same concerns that we all. Not a politician. I will be. But I'm not a politician today. But I will make you this promise and I will keep this promise. In four or five years' time, when we're back in this room again, and we'll be back in it a few times between then and now, but in four or five years' time, when I ask that question, can we name at least three names, you will know the answer to that question. And that's what we mean about transparency and accountability. You need to know who is responsible for the laws and regulations that are affecting your life. You need to know, and they need to make themselves known to you. Job creation and economic investment in this country. What are the attractions? Our competitive, flexible tax policy and our low corporate tax rates. Those things that people like Dick Roach and others will tell you are perfectly safe. Yet the French finance minister, Christine Lagarde, last year said that during the French presidency of the EU that tax harmonisation across Europe was going to be their top priority. The top priority of the French presidency. We voted no and they didn't get to do that. A few weeks ago, one of the German Chancellor's top economic advisers said that Ireland would have to sacrifice, as he put it, your sacred low corporate taxes. There is an elite in Brussels and their supporters who absolutely wish to eliminate our tax competitiveness. Why? Because they are inefficient themselves. Because if they can saddle us with the same tax criteria, if they can harmonise our taxes with theirs, we will not attract foreign direct investment into this country. Why? Because if someone has to operate under the same tax base or tax rate here, as they do in France or in Germany, people are going to invest where the big net rail distribution and road distribution networks are and where the big centres of population are in Europe. They're not going to come to Sligo or Monaco or Galway or Ennis or Athlone. <coughs> They're not going to do it. I know the reality. I've been there. And I've built businesses across 10 countries in Europe and the United States of America, which apparently is a bad thing in some people's eyes. But I make no apologies for it. And I am pro-European, and I know there may be people in here who are not. I am. I am pro-European. I believe in the European project. It has been one of the most successful peace processes in the history of democracy. It's where the governed, that's all of us, can hold the government, the place that makes the rules and the regulations and exercises them, accountable at the ballot box. And the fact is, you cannot hold the people that make somewhere between 70% of your laws and regulations now accountable in the ballot box because you don't even know who they are. As we just established here this evening. All of us and everybody else across Europe. And we have that in common with people in Latvia and France and Spain and Germany and Britain and everywhere else. And we have to change it. Because if we don't change it, the European project will fail. So people are waking up to the fact that democracy is now being held in contempt by some elites in Europe. What's the evidence? The French people had a vote on the so-called European Constitution. Millions of them voted no, in a big majority. The Dutch people did the same thing. Millions of them voted no. Majority of over 60%. In Ireland, we had our referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, which was the same thing as the European Constitution, they just changed the name. 
and we voted no in a higher percentage, interestingly, than got Barack Obama in as President of the United States. No one's asking him to have to run for re-election. There was an American historian, Clinton Rosser, he said, you cannot have democracy without politics, and you cannot have politics without parties. And there have been no European parties, so they can't be a European democracy, because the parties aren't there to bring about the focus, to shed the light on what's going on, to such a point that you don't know the name of one single person that makes more than 70% of your laws and regulations today. And neither do I. And we have a group of lobbyists, more than 15,000 of them, lobbying these people that we don't know to make these laws and regulations. How do we fix it? Well, this is what Libertax did. We looked at the problem and we said, how can you make this whole thing transparent and accountable? Because then it can start working for people. So we, a lot of us from across Europe, decided to form the first genuinely pan-European political party in the history of Europe. Which is a tall order, but someone had to do it. The only thing I find surprising now is that no one's done it before. And we announced today that we are running just over 300 candidates across, at the moment, 24 member states of the European Union for the European elections at the beginning of June. Over 300 candidates. So what is the role of these candidates? Well, we think, and we're doing a lot of work on this, that we can, we're targeting a win of just over 100 seats in the European Parliament. That would make Libertas very powerful as the first and only genuine party in the European Parliament, and it would give us a control over a swing vote and a blocking minority. Maybe we can do even better than that. Maybe we can do better than that. And what we are going to do is we're going to introduce a few new fresh rules to the way that business is done in Brussels. We already announced, I announced in Stockholm when we launched our candidate list in Sweden of I think 22 candidates, we said that we were putting lobbyists in Brussels on notice and their clients that if a special interest group, a client, hires a lobbyist who is not registered, who is lobbying secretly, for some new regulation or law or whatever it may be, if they use an unregistered lobbyist, <coughs> we will block that law. We don't care what it is, we'll block it. What's the message to the clients of those lobbyists? If you use an unregistered lobbyist that does not declare their interest, that's the kiss of death for whatever it is you're trying to get done. That will force every lobbyist in Brussels that wants to make a living to have to register and declare their interest. Simple. No one done it before. No one could do it before. No one had the will to do it before. We will do it. Why is that good? Because as soon as the lobbyists start to lobby the Commission, they will have to notify us, and you'll all be notified. It will be available on the internet. They'll have to declare who they're lobbying for, who's paying them. Why do we need that new law or regulation? Where's the demand coming from? Is it a grassroots need? Are you asking for it? Has anyone here asked for a regulation from Brussels lately? No. But someone's asking for them, so we want just to know who is it. Not an unreasonable question, I think. We're going to ask the question, why does this law need to be made in Brussels? Why can't it be made in Dublin or London or Berlin or anywhere else? Does it need to be made in Brussels? If it does, fine. Good. If it needs to be made at the Euro European level, that's called subsidiarity. And then we're going to introduce the Libertas two for one rule. We're going to say to the Commission bureaucrats, for every new piece of red tape, for every new regulation that you want to introduce, and you send it down the pipe to the European Parliament for approval, you have to attach two existing pieces of regulation that we don't need anymore. That's how we slim Brussels down and make it